right, so in the previous video, we solved a difference equation for the zero input response, and that difference equation had distinct roots. In this video, we're gonna do something very similar. We're still looking at solving a difference equation for the zero input response, but in the example we'll work here, the characteristic equation of the system has repeated roots. So we'll take a look at how we have to modify our guess for the zero input solution to account for those repeated roots. So here is the difference equation we will take a look at in this video. We have repeated roots, the uh, discrete time LTI system that we'll be talking with and working with is described this way. So you can see right away, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of uh, just jump to the operator notation, but we know how to convert these E's into time delays. But let's go ahead and just start off describing it compactly in that manner. So again, one thing that might uh, kind of worry you is the right side here looks really complicated. And if we were solving for the total response, that would be something we would have to account for. But again, keep in mind what we're doing here. We are solving for the zero input response. So even though the right side of this equation looks complicated, we are solving it for the case of the input equaling zero. So this is really, I don't care for all practical purposes for what we're trying to solve for here. Again, if you want to, you can go back to the uh, difference equation version. If you'd like, take the E's and convert it into Y of K plus twos and K plus ones. There's just a little reminder on how you do that. But we're gonna go ahead and start solving for the zero input response. Just refresh, remember again, the zero input response is due only to initial conditions. So we have to know some initial conditions for the system. Otherwise, the system at rest with no initial conditions will just have an output of zero for all time, which is a pretty boring thing. So for this particular problem, our initial conditions are assumed to be these values right here. At time minus one, the output was equal to minus two thirds, and at time minus two, the output was equal to one ninth. All right, so let's go ahead and figure out the things that we need to know. For the zero input response, what we really want to know are the roots of the characteristic equation. So first, we identify the characteristic polynomial. There's the characteristic polynomial QE, we replace all the E's with gammas to get this characteristic polynomial right here, gamma squared plus six gamma plus nine. And we set that equal to zero here in a minute to get the characteristic equation. Obviously right now I can tell that this factors very nicely, this characteristic polynomial, into gamma plus three quantity squared. And here we can see how we're gonna end up with our repeated roots. There's a second order root of gamma equals negative three in this system. If we set this um, equal to zero, we now have the characteristic equation. So here's the characteristic equation. And as I already uh, noted, the uh, characteristic roots are repeated. There's uh, gamma equals negative three is repeated twice. So that means my characteristic modes are minus three to the K. When I have distinct roots, I would go ahead and just write down the other one, some number to the K. But in the case of repeated roots, remember what we do. The next one we multiply by K minus three to the K. So in this case, with just two, um, or I'm sorry, a repeated root of order two, we have the value to the k and then k, that value to the k. If we had a repeated root of order three, we would have the root to the k, k, that root to the k, k squared, that root to the k. You just keep going with more and more um, powers of k out front as your guess. So those are our characteristic modes. And now we can go ahead and construct the zero input response. Remember the zero input response is a linear combination of the characteristic modes. So when I take a linear combination of things, I multiply by some coefficients and add them up. So C1 times the first mode plus C2 times the second mode. One thing that's nice is since each of these have a common factor of minus three to the K, I'm gonna go ahead and factor that term out and write my zero input response in this form. You don't have to do it that way, but sometimes it kind of help simplify the math by uh, factoring that out. All right, so we know the form of our zero input response. The only thing that I have left to do now is solve for the unknowns. And again, we always solve for those unknown constants using our initial conditions. So we were given a value of our signal at time minus one. At that time, the output was equal to negative two thirds. So I know that minus two thirds has to equal this equation with K replaced with minus one. So I replace K with minus one there and K with minus one right there. And then negative three raised to the power negative one is obviously a negative one third. So that's one of my equations. The other equation comes from at time minus two, we were told our initial condition was one ninth. 
So again, replace all the k's up here with the value of negative 2, and you end up with this equation right here. And then I can simplify these a little bit. If I multiply everything out and collect my coefficients, I end up with two equations. One equation is minus one-third C1 plus one-third C2 equals a negative two-thirds. And the other equation is one-ninth C1 minus two-ninths C2 equals one-ninth. I like to put that in kind of a linear algebra matrix vector form like this, because that's how I like to solve it in MATLAB or on my calculator. And if I go ahead and, you know, inverse this matrix and multiply both sides by that, I can isolate the unknowns C1 and C2, and I find out that C1 and C2 can be written like this. So I went ahead and wrote that out for you last time. I think on the previous video, I just assumed you knew how to do that. But the inverse of this matrix is right here. And then multiplying that out, we get that C1 is 3 and C2 is 1. So now I know the numbers to go plug in up here. So I can go ahead and do that and write down my final answer for the zero input response. It's 3, negative 3 to the k, plus k, negative 3 to the k, because C2 was equal to 1. And that is my zero input response for the case of having some repeated roots. And hopefully that explains how you go about modifying your guess in the case that you do have some repeated roots. All right, that's it for now. In the uh, next video, we'll go ahead and look at the kind of the final case of interest. What happens when you have conjugate roots? Now those conjugate roots are distinct, so we could just do it like we did in our first video, but it's more interesting to combine pairs of complex conjugate roots into kind of a damped cosine term. So watch the next video to see how to do that.